السلام عليكم Good afternoon everybody أتمنى تكونوا جميعا بخير وفي أحسن حال Today we are in the second scientific day Hopefully it will be one of the amazing days and we are happy to be in this uh, amazing event, inshallah. Uh, today we, uh, we start uh, from now until uh, 8 p.m. Uh, KSA and Egypt time. Uh, today we start with from above and down until <laughs> uh, head and neck with uh, Dr. Khaled Gad, our dear uh, professor. Uh, Dr. Khaled Gad has been uh, have been uh, working since many years uh, as a professor in Egypt, as also he is a PhD, FRCR certified, uh, and uh, his subspeciality. It is in uh, neuroradiology. Uh, today he is going to uh, give us uh, like a brief about acute head and neck infections. Uh, I, I think it will be amazing lecture as usual from him. So uh, let's uh, start and see uh, what he, Dr. Khaled, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, so yes, here. Uh, we are waiting and we are uh, listening to you right now. And uh, Dr. Head also have uh, a neuroradiology fellowship from uh, um, USA. I think from uh, John Hopkins. Yeah, right, Dr. Head. So uh, let's start. And we are uh, really eager to have a lot of uh, information about them. thank you uh yeah thank you dr mahmoud uh for the introduction and just for uh, uh do, you, do you hear me well can you hear me well the sound very well the sound very quality well. sound quality okay okay so need, no need to use the mic i, I guess i I'm, because i'm i'm speaking uh through the um, through the through the computer speaker so i'm not using any uh, microphones I think Perfect. it's uh, okay. Thank you very much. And for those who are, uh, so I don't, I don't want you to to be confused because uh, neuroradiology fellowship. Because in neuroradiology, actually, it includes both head and neck and spine. So why a neuroradiologist is talking about head and neck, this might be confusing to others. Uh, but uh, in 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 fact, uh, the neuroradiology uh, curriculum or subspecialty includes uh, head and neck and spine as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, very much for the um, for the introduction, and also I just uh, want to make sure that you are uh, seeing my slides right now. You can see the first slide as yes, one slide, yes. right? So very, slide very show good. is working. Yes. So you see you see one very slide only, right? Not yes. many slides. Perfect. Okay. Very good. So should I start now? Yes, we are waiting for you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So well, so yeah, it's true that uh, that acute head and neck infections uh, represent a real emergency, and um, uh, you might receive a call uh, during midnight, for example, with a case of uh, paranasal sinus CT. And some people think, like, why, why should a patient with uh, with sinus infection uh, come at midnight and there is a referral? Uh, from the physician uh, asking for a CT, for example. And many of us think of these cases as, okay, no immediate, um, no need to do an immediate action. So why not to come in the morning? But it's not always uh, true. Um, and we'll see that uh, very shortly. So I have no relevant disclosures. And this is what I meant to start with is whenever you receive a call from the emergency uh, department with a case of acute head neck infections, you should be very careful because sometimes these patients may uh, progress very badly uh, with uh, impact on their uh, life, for example, especially if the airway is compromised or if these lesions progress to uh, eventually to uncontrolled sepsis. 
And some, uh, and or or the other scenario, uh, which is also bad, is uh, uh, the uh, when they get loss of function of an eloquent organ of the body, such as the orbit, which is not too far from the uh, from the neck or the head and neck, uh, and of course the brain, uh, where most of these lesions have a high potential for intracranial uh, spread. So this is my first message: is always deal with these cases very carefully because sometimes they deserve to be uh, managed appropriately and immediately. Uh, what, are, uh, what are the imaging techniques we use? We've, uh, we have a long list um, in, the, um, in the shopping cart, uh, if you will, including CT, of course, and MRI, which is kept only for uh, specific indications, basically intracranial extension. Ultrasound is useful, of course, uh, when it comes to superficial collections or when you need to guide your needle for aspiration. Uh, but let's agree on the fact that CT is the modality of choice. And this could be an exam question. So why CT is your modality of choice in these cases? And I would personally consider CT uh, a fast uh, a fast scanning uh, technique. You can use your uh, tools for reconstruction so that you can see the coronal and sagittal as well. You may extend the field of view to, to cover the mediastinum, the chest, and the brain in some cases, which is sometimes very important. Uh, keep in mind that these patients are uh, are in pain. They are uh, they are they can be um, they can be uh, moving inside the scanner. So uh, CT is is relatively less sensitive to motion compared to MRI, for example. And put, when it comes to availability, of course, CT is uh, CT beats MRI in terms of availability. What do I do whenever I see a case of acute head and neck infection? Is I always start with asking me with asking myself the first question, which starts with the three C's. So my approach to these cases always starts with the three C's. Is there a collection? What is the cause? And which, which, which complications are potentially uh, present? Collection is important because it's surgically drainable. Most of these fluid collections are surgically drainable. And you need to tell the physician this piece of information to prepare the OR, to prepare the anesthesia, to proceed with something else other than medical treatment. So collection always comes as a priority in your approach, reading uh, images or uh, let's say CT in these cases. And the cause is potentially your job because, because you might see the fluid collection and everyone else can see it, but what wh where's the etiology? What is the origin of this collection? And we'll see this shortly. And then, and then of course, complications which must be included in your report, whether they are present or not. So these are relevant data. This is a, a relevant piece of information that must be included in your report, even if they are not present. What kind of complications do we have? They're all, they are also three. So the three complications, which I, uh, which I use the mnemonic, the abs to remember them, starts with the airway. Most importantly, cannot stress more on this uh, part. Airway comes first. Airway is very important. Uh, and then blood vessels or any vascular structure that might be affected and the spread of infection. Head and neck region is always, uh, is all, there's, there, there are many conduit from each compartment to another. So spread of infection is very likely uh, possible with these uh, infection and the spread uh, can go also to uh, four different compartments. And we need to remember always that we need to stop, we need to have a role to stop the spread uh, of infection by looking at spaces, other spaces in the neck, in the deep neck compartments or other nearby spaces, and then look at the thorax, look at the orbits, and finally uh, also to the brain because intracranial spread is very likely. So to wrap up all these things together in one slide, I start with approaching these cases by, by looking at the three Cs, collection, cause, and complications, which can be either on the airway in terms of compromise or narrowing, blood vessels, any vascular <clears throat> complications, such as thrombosis, for example, and we see that, or spread of the collection or the infection or the phlegmon, let's say. And spread can be to nearby spaces, to the thoracic cavity, to the orbit, or to the brain. And remember that we need to stop uh, any uh, possibility of spread. So in the following, in the remaining time of my lecture, I'll try to cover six different compartments. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course, I'm not going to cover every single example in head and neck infections, but let's say we, uh, it's it's going to be the it's going to be 
uh, uh, popular or common examples that you are going to see in your practice. And let me also say that these examples, there are some examples that you are likely going to see in your exam uh, setting. So the exams are usually, uh, it's very likely to see at least one or two of these cases in your exam, whether the viva, whether the oral exams or the long case or so any film reading session in the exams will likely include uh, one or more of these examples. Let's start by the dental oral cavity compartment. And I have the first patient who's a, an adult who presents to the emergency department with left cheek swelling. And the patient is diagnosed as facial cellulitis. And it's very easy to see this normal soft tissue here in the left cheek that involves the skin subcutaneous layer and also along the deep fascial compartments, including the muscle, the facial muscles might, might be the vaccinator in this example, or uh, you can just say the facial muscles. But when you look carefully at other levels, you'll be able to see the collection. Remember that collections are not always hypodense or fluid-like. They can be turbid when they have pus inside, so they look like adjacent soft tissues um, uh, in, the, in this image. And once you see the collection, your job is to find out what is the cause? So remember the three C's, collection and then cause. And in these cases, you have to use your bone algorithm uh, because it's, it's, I'm not sure about your practice, but many people, when they do neck CT, they do not include the bone window, especially if you're not using packs. If you're still reading on films, sometimes they, um, they print the images only in the soft, with the soft tissue algorithm. So it's your job in these cases because in facial cellulites, you need to think of two etiologies most commonly either sinusitis or dental infection. And in this case, when, we, uh, when, you, when you do the bone algorithm, you'll be able to see this odontogenic infection, this radiolucency around one of the roots uh, of the teeth of the mandible where it eroded through the cortex and resulted in this uh, infection. So when you apply the, uh, our approach, you'll start by finding the collection, important because it's drainable and the cause is odontogenic and there are no complications. Nothing involving the airway, no blood ves vessels here, and no spread to other uh, compartments. So my tip of uh, this case, or my take home message of this case is usually use bone window in cases of facial cellulitis and try to sometimes do multiplanar reconstructions because these radiolucency are sometimes very tiny or too tiny to be detected. So my second patient is an adult who has a neck pain and swelling. And again, the patient has a left submandibular uh, swelling or uh, soft tissue uh, normality and, and facial uh, stranding, uh, fat stranding. And you can see here this hypodensity, which is related to the salivary gland. And always remember that in a submandibular space, pathology or infectious pathologies come from three origins, either the gland itself, the salivary gland, or a lymph node in the submandibular region, and also dental. Because we sometimes radiologists think like the, Think of dental pathologies as something that that you never see. Or, but in 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 reality, these patients uh, with dental re related complications, they usually go to the hospital. They don't go back to the dentist. They go to, they go to the hospital. So you are supposed to be, to be the one who will see these cases. So always include dental origin or dental pathology uh, as an etiology in these uh, cases. You'll be able to see the collection. So first of all, you see this. Phlegmon here, which is very close to the salivary gland. It might be part of the salivary gland, but it's not true in this case because you'll see the final uh, images now in a, in a minute. A lymph node is here, submandibular lymph node is here. Do not mistake this with the level two lymph nodes because, because level two are always posterior to the salivary gland itself. And there's a collection here. And once you do uh, your bone window, you'll be able to see, again, this radiolucency around the third molar that is actually responsible for this uh, pathology and the whole case is now related to uh, its of dental origin. This is important because now we will refer the patient to the dentist or at least we will ask for urgent dental consultation uh, in these cases. And it's important to, to, um, to um, consider or to remember that uh, the, the, there is a relationship between the location of the dental pathology and the location of the collection because you have two in the floor of the mouth here, you have the sublingual space and you have the submandibular space. And sometimes, sometimes this is very uh, helpful in detecting the origin of the collection. And uh, the demarcation between the two spaces is the myelohyoid muscle. So once you see the myelohyoid muscle, which is the sling 
in the floor of the mouth with the sublingual space above and the submandibular space below. And when you see the myelohyoid muscle, it's always very helpful because collection above or below the myelohyoid muscle, or in other words, in the sublingual submandibular spaces, may lead to to define or to identify the where is it coming from in terms of uh, dental uh, origin. Because incisors, canines, premolars, and first molar roots always lie above the muscle, so it give you sublingual collections, while uh, infections coming from the second or third molar because the roots lie below the myelohyoid muscle will most probably give you submandibular fluid collection. Let's see the next patient. Oh, this is not the next patient. This is the, the patient I just, uh, I've just shown you uh, a minute before, this one, who uh, he actually left back home. He was sent back home with antibiotics and uh, he was given an appointment with the dentist, but actually he came two days later with a bad spread of uh, infection. And here you can apply your uh, your, pro your your algorithm uh, by uh, looking at the complication. So what's the complication now? It's spread of infection from the submandibular space to the sublingual space. And you can see here the myelohyoid muscle, the sling in the coronal view, where the sublingual space above and submandibular space below. And whenever you see this appearance with spread of, of abscess or pus or fluid collection, in the floor of the mouth, you should think of one entity, very important entity, which is called Ludwig's angina, and this is an exam case. Why Ludwig's angina, regardless of the term, if you're still using it or not? Because it's a clinical diagnosis more than a radiologic diagnosis. But the term is very important to be mentioned, at least when you comment on these cases in front of the examiner. It's very important to mention this term because, because of what? Because always remember that Ludwig's angina is will give you a potential complication uh, on the airway. So will result in airway compromise if untreated or if neglected. So this that's and this is why it's very critical to make this uh, uh, to miss designation or to label these cases correctly as Ludwig's engine. So when you apply your approach, yes, there is a collection. The cause is odontogenic because we've seen that previously, and there is complication. Now we have complications in terms of what spread. So spread into other spaces because it started in the submandibular space, but now it is in the sublingual uh, uh, space. And once you see it here, you should think of Ludwig's angina, and you should secure the airway. And, and in my opinion, you can you can discontinue your comment on the case in front of the examiner and say, I want now to look at the airway. I want to make sure that the airway is patent because this might happen in, in minutes. In, in, in a few hours. And I usually, whenever I see this case in the ER, I usually call the physician. I usually verb and verbally communicate these findings with the physician before uh, making, uh, before finalizing the report. And this is another case of Ludwig's angina. And you can see here the abscess in the floor of the mouth and look carefully at the airway, what's happening here. There is edema here in the aeripiglottic fold and in the right paraglottic space and the airway is, is getting more partially effaced from the right side, uh, even though that the collection is on the left side, but it's very easy to get access through the, uh, the base of the tongue. It actually displaces the tongue, so this adds to the compromise and then reaches uh, to this uh, paraglottic region and the aeripiglottic fold, sometimes the epiglottis itself, and it can result in airway compromise. And you can miss, you can lose the patient just because of airway compromise, not because of the infection itself. So always remember that you need to secure a patent airway um, in cases of Ludwig's angina. So angina, A, angina, A, airways. This is uh, the way I remember. It. Okay, so A, angina, A, airway. And you can say also A, angina, A, airway, A, aspiration pneumonia, because sometimes they get, uh, they get um, aspiration pneumonia as a, as a complication from the pus oozing from the mucosal surfaces by ulcers and blisters and, and so on. There's a mimicker case that I'd like to show here. It's not commonly uh, seen, and I'm not sure if if it's um, if you've seen a similar case before, but it happens, especially with aller with allergic patients, the drug in use, or it due to any other allergens such as insect bites. And these patients may get facial swelling. And I think you might remember one of your friends or one of your uh, relatives who had uh, this presentation before. Uh, they come with uh, with a diffuse facial swelling that involves the lips as well. So, and this is this might be a differentiating uh, factor clinically that involvement of the lips in this manner. Uh, and you can see it also here 
uh, is a differentiating factor because uh, uh, from uh, the infectious causes because the treatment of course will be different treatment is as bicorticosteroids and antihistamines as you know and this is a drug a case of drug induced angioedema but at the end of the day we have also uh, potential uh, airway uh, compromise as well because the edema may extend to the airway and also your job is to make sure that the airway is patent in these cases uh, uh, regardless of the etiology of the condition itself. When we speak about dental or odontogenic lesions, we should include the masticator space uh, in our uh, description. Why? Because when you, the masticator space is the one in purple here, and we'll revise the anatomy very shortly. Uh, briefly, it's the, man, the mandible lives here, and this is why odontogenic infections from the mandible can arise in masticator space infection as well. And you have the anatomy that everyone knows, the masseter muscle is outside, is, is lateral to the mandible, and inside you have the pterygoid muscles here, medial and lateral pterygoid, and this small uh, uh, temporalis muscle as well. And remember that there is extension of the masticator space above the zygomatic process, which we call the suprazygomatic compartment of the masticator space. Uh, the masticator space is important because any infection that lives in the masticator space is most likely, until proven otherwise, of odontogenic origin. And this is very helpful when you see a case of, you know the anatomy. So whenever you see an abscess here in the masticator space, second step, immediately go to the dentition and make sure that the dentition is normal. Because almost always an, odontogen an, an abscess in the masticator space is of odontogenic origin. And this is the same case with in MRI. Uh, where there's extension even to the suprazygomatic component of a masticator space abscess. And always, my tip of this case is, in masticator space abscesses, always look for dental uh, cause. My last case in this section is salivary gland itself. Make sure whenever you see a case of submandibular salivitis that there is no abscess. And do not mistake, uh, do not by mistake, call these hypodensities or nodules or uh, crypt-like configuration. This is normal crypt-like configuration of the salivary gland. So these are not micro abscesses. An abscess is an abscess. An abscess looks like that. And uh, for example, in these uh, cases, you always need to be uh, sure that there is no uh, calcular etiology of the infection because it's very common for these cases to see uh, calculi. So uh, uh, so um, the, the salivary gland is here in the submandibular region but the duct is in the uh, sublingual region. And you always uh, make sure that you look at the duct here, the Wharton's duct, where you can see two calculi. One of them is probably responsible for this, um, for this presentation. So there's collection and the cause is your responsibility in this case. The cause is your job to find it out and to tell the physician, the referring physician. Well, moving to the parotid gland, I have only a few, uh, I think two cases only in the parotid region. But let's first um, make a quick uh, or a brief revision of the anatomy of the parotid landmarks, starting with the mandibular ramus here. And then once you identify the mandibular ramus, the masseter muscle is very easy to see just outside it. And then the Stenson's duct is important to trace because whenever you see the masseter muscle, it will be easy to look anteriorly along the duct, the Stenson's duct of the parotid uh, gland. And uh, but just by the way, remember that the facial uh, vein is anterior to the insertion of the duct here at the level of the second uh, molar, upper molar. Well, after seeing the Stenson's duct, the parotid gland itself is easy to see just posterior to the mandible. And it's always helpful to uh, identify the two parts of it. There's a superficial lobe and uh, just underneath the superficial lobe is the retromandibular vein and there is a deep lobe. Uh, inside. In MRI, the same anatomy can be also um, traced where you can see the mandibular ramus always start with the ramus. It's easy to see uh, because superficially there will be the masseter muscle. It's your important clue or guiding uh, landmark uh, to the stenson duct. Stenson duct is anterior to them. And this is why we need to look at the muscle first because the stenson duct is just anterior to it. And the parotid gland itself is easy. Uh, to see where the superficial lobe lies in superficial to the retromandibular vein that separates the deep lobe uh, inside. Case of parotitis. Parotitis actually is a diagnosis, an easy diagnosis. The gland is enlarged, the gland is uh, heterogeneous, the gland has more enhancement uh, compared to the other side. And again, do not call these 
crypt-like configuration or the asinine configuration of the gland as micro abscesses. Abscess is a different uh, appearance. Abscess is an abscess, okay? So it's normal to find these uh, asin this asinine configuration of the parotid gland uh, in patients with parotides. What's the cause? Your job is to trace the Stenson's duct. The Stenson's duct can be traced the anterior to the masseter muscle where you can find this uh, stone inside. This is very easy to be missed, by the way. So when you see a, a case of parotitis, uh, it's not uncommon to be uh, to miss a very small stone uh, in the Stenson's duct because you do not know how to follow or what's your approach in these cases. Always identify the anatomy. Start with the masseter muscle because the Stenson's duct will be uh, anteriorly wrapping around the muscle, as you can see here. So applying your your uh, list here, there's no collection, uh, but I can see the cause from this image is a stone in the Stenson's uh, duct of the parotid uh, gland. Uh, so um, moving to uh, this companion case, again, uh, I'm just putting this case to show you that uh, some people can get confused because when you see this case, you see this case and you see the Stenson's duct dilated. So I have a parotides here. And it's very easy to see the Stenson's duct is hugely dilated compared to the other one. And you can see the normal anatomy here just for comparison, for as a reference. So some people can mistakenly call the one of these uh, structures as a calculus. So it's important always to, uh, I told you in the, uh, in the beginning uh, that the facial vein is, lies anterior to the duct. So this one is the, stone, but the other one is the facial vein. So especially if you see these cases post-contrast, if you don't have a pre-contrast study, you will be, um, it, it's gonna be confusing, but if you know the anatomy well, it's it's uh, it's now easy. And the other thing is that it's not uncommon to see other, other stones. So uh, don't uh, get stuck, don't, don't get uh, trapped with a satisfaction of search phenomenon when you see one diagnosis and say, okay, I got it, here's the diagnosis. Actually, there is another stone here in the duct uh, that lies posterior. So my tip of these um, cases, look always for duct obstruction. Do not mix distal stones with the anterior facial vein. And it's not uncommon to find multiple stones. So make sure that you scrutinize your images for uh, multiple stones. Moving to the pharynx, uh, larynx. Uh, so I'll try to move. Um, more quickly because it's uh, actually uh, almost 25 minutes now. Oh, 30 minutes. So um, so here's a 50-year-old female with history of pharyngitis. And you can see here, uh, and there's trismus as well. Trismus is an ability to open the mouth. And you can see there is a collection here at the level of the oropharynx. So I say oropharynx slash tonsillar lesion. I, I do not um, it's not easy. Or, it's not always easy to uh, to differentiate the two locations. But I know because this is the level of the oropharynx. How do I do? I always try to I try to stress on how to do. How do I do it? Not not the knowledge itself, but the practical part of it. So this is the oropharynx. And if you ask me, how did you know that this is the oropharynx? Because the maxilla is here and the mandible here. Once you see the maxilla and the mandible in the same plane, so this is the oropharynx. Well, and the oropharynx has a tonsil, tonsillar region, of course, and you have this collection in the oropharynx. But the sagittal and coronal view are very important. Why? Because it will, it will define the location of the collection relative to the tonsil. The tonsil is always this enhancing striated structure that you can see here in both sides. So these striations are very important to define that this is the tonsil. And this is normal. The normal enhancement of the tonsil is the striated appearance, the striated pattern. And if, you, if I ask you now, where's the collection relative to tonsil, you would say it is above, because the tonsil is below the collection. So the collection is above the tonsil, and actually it's superior lateral to the tonsil, uh, if you'd like to be more uh, specific. I think we need to uh, ask everyone to mute uh, themselves. Okay, so please uh, make sure that you are muted, because we're getting uh, some noise here. So whenever you see uh, a collection that is above the tonsil, as you can see here in this example, this will be a clue that this is a peritus tonsillar axis. Because if the collection is, uh, please, uh, okay, I will mute the one. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so uh, there was noise coming from one of the uh, attendees and I just muted uh, her, uh, Mike. So the collection is above the tonsil, which tells you that this abscess is peritonsillar. Because if the collection is within the tonsil itself, it's going to be intratonsillar. And as you can see, there is a big difference in terms of management uh, in these cases. So this is a case of peritonsillar abscess. And I... Uh, and it's uh, again, it's critically important to define where's the abscess in uh, relative to the tonsil. And the other thing that you also will need to um, define is the relationship to the carotid artery, the carotid space, because uh, there is a retropharyngeal space here as well. So if it is an oropharyngeal or tonsillar, it most probably it will not, it will either not affect the carotid or it will push the carotid space. Uh, posteriorly, as we'll see very shortly. And then comment on the airway. Always remember to comment on the airway because in this example, the airway is slightly pushed maybe. And I'm putting the other case as a compare, as a comparison uh, case with a suppurative retropharyngeal lymph node here. And you can see the airway is pushed, um, it's medial to the carotid and the airway is pushed from uh, posterior. So when you apply uh, the, the algorithm, there is a collection, and the cause is uh, tonsillar uh, pathology or infection. It, it's above the tonsil, so you should define it as peritonsillar. Comment on the airway. Make sure that you comment also on the blood vessels, which are not displaced in this uh, scenario. And, uh, of course, there is no spread. Why peritonsillar abscess is critically important to identify? Because it can spread, because the collection is outside the tonsil. It's outside the capsule. It's between the tonsil and the constrictor muscle. So it's very easy for these cases to spread to nearby spaces. However, intratonsillar abscess can be treated very easily because they, these collections are confined within the capsule and the potential for spread is very, very unlikely. Okay, so again, superior above the capsule, they're always anterior to the carotid. They can push the carotid posteriorly. Make sure you comment on that and it uh, usually requires drainage. And by the way, it's it's a scenario that happens in adults. It, it's not most likely where tonsillitis is more common in children, but peritonsillar abscess is actually a complication that is frequently seen uh, in adults. This is not a, this is not an imaging scenario. It's most likely these cases are clinically diagnosed and you don't see them in the emergency department because they can be diagnosed clinically and they can be just uh, aspirated and, uh, or even aspiration can be used as a diagnostic tool in, this, in these cases. But it happens sometimes that they send you these cases for CT, especially if the ENT physician is not confident or is not uh, available, which is uh, sometimes uh, the case. Uh, this, this, uh, the other uh, scenario uh, I've just mentioned I, and I want to make emphasis on is the retropharyngeal space because we have here what we call the danger space. And let me give a brief note on that. The, the retropharyngeal space is this space. You have this uh, cleft, very thin cleft of fat between the constrictor muscle of the pharynx and the prevertebral musculature. Uh, and you don't always have to see it. It's, it, it. You're lucky in this example that we can see it, but sometimes it's a potential space that you cannot, uh, you cannot even, uh, you cannot be sure that you can uh, identify it. But it's a potential space in this region. And of course, uh, everyone should know this. This part that the alar fascia is a slip of fascia that extends between the two carotids, between bilateral carotids here, and it splits this space into two compartments. One compartment anterior, which we call the retropharyngeal space proper, and the other compartment posterior is called the danger space. Why it's the danger space? Because more inferiorly, this slip of fascia will fuse with the retropharyngeal uh, space. So it's going, the retropharyngeal space will end here. However, the danger space will continue freely until it communicates with the mediastinum, not to mention that collection in the danger space will result in mediastinal abscess or at least uh, mediastinitis, which is a life-threatening condition. So an example of a retropharyngeal superior adenitis, we can see the collection here in the, sub, in the retropharyngeal space. Remember that the airway is pushed from the back compared to the oropharyngeal or the tonsillar uh, location. And the carotid space is always, or sometimes it gets displaced this way, which again confirms the location of the uh, of the collection in the retropharyngeal space. And uh, uh, the other scenarios, so this is one of the scenarios. The other scenario, which is very common and classic for exams, is the uh, POTS disease of the spine, or 
even pyogenic uh, spondylitis. So tuberculosis for pyogenic spondylitis can give you, again, uh, collect fluid collection or abscess that can traverse the prevertebral compartment to the retropharyngeal or the danger space as well. And you can see the abscess here that collects and then uh, extends inferiorly. In these cases, whenever you see these cases in your practice or in the exam, always make sure that you tell the examiner explicitly that you want to look at the mediastinum. I want to include images from the uh, CT chest to be, and probably uh, the examiner will have these images hidden uh, in the basket and will be, uh, will be given to you whenever you, uh, when you say it, uh, and to make sure that you don't have a mediastinal abscess as in this case. And remember that these, uh, this complication is life threatening. Mortality rate is very high uh, in these scenarios. Uh, well, of course, you. Uh, I'm not going to repeat this uh, anymore. Uh, you know uh, how to proceed through uh, this uh, list. Uh, the other spread, the other pattern of spread to the thorax or the mediastinum can can be uh, a scenario uh, that is again an exam case, and I've seen it uh, before uh, many times. A patient who presents with pharyngitis, and then examiner might or might not tell you in the history that there is now respiratory distress or pneumonia or whatever, uh, any kind of, of respiratory uh, symptoms. And when you see, um, of course, there's pharyngitis that you can't see here in the image, but when you see, when you look carefully, uh, you'll be able to see these, these lymph nodes. But again, uh, but it's very important to look at the jugular vein in this example and make sure that and see that it's not enhancing compared to the other side, which means that there is internal jugular thrombosis. Once you see this appearance, make sure that you look at the chest because this is called, uh, you can see here multiple scattered pneumonic patches in the lungs, bilateral lungs. And of course, we call this Limier uh, syndrome, uh, which is for some reasons um, a, um, a common case, a popular case uh, in the exam. So I know examiners love this uh, scenario. So make sure you're familiar with this uh, kind of complication. I told you that the peritonsillar abscess is in a relatively free compartment, which means that it can spread uh, to other spaces. As you can see here in this example, peritonsillar abscess that's, that's spread to the parapharyngeal space. From the parapharyngeal space, it uh, found an exit uh, to the parotid space and from the parotid space to the masticator space. And then more superiorly, the, this is a suprazygomatic compartment of the masticator space. So this is this patient. Patient is unfortunate uh, to have all these kinds of spread in a in, in a scenario uh, where uh, a peritonsillar abscess was neglected or was untreated uh, properly in the beginning. You have also sub uh, lingual sub uh, in the floor of the mouth collection, and the patient had uh, to uh, be uh, intubated. And of course, the reason is once you have collection in the floor of the mouth here, uh, the airway is will probably get. Uh, compromised. Uh, moving to another entity in the in this region, it's the larynx, and I do not think you would find an emergency in terms of uh, infections in the larynx unless you see a case of a pyre or infected laryngocele. You call pyre laryngocele or infected laryngocele. Very quickly, a laryngocele is an air filled or fluid filled. Make sure that you know this uh, uh, information. This piece of information can be fluid filled. And it's in the paraglottic um, uh, space here in this example. And uh, another case of infected laryngocele. It's, it's not a common uh, scenario, but it, you can uh, get encountered with these uh, cases in your practice. And uh, make sure that you comment on these cases properly because treatment is different when you have an internal laryngocele versus an external laryngocele. And the uh, landmark is always this uh, virtual plane connecting the uh, thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone, uh, to the hyoid bone from the, to the thyroid cartilage. Uh, this is called the thyrohyoid membrane. And once the laryngocele uh, extends through the thyrohyoid membrane, uh, it is uh, called mixed internal and external. And actually the treatment uh, is different. So uh, I wanna show that we can, so for some reason, okay. So when you, when you uh, I'm, I'm trying to scroll through the images and you see that, uh, this is the thyroid membrane and how the laryngocele actually uh, extended through uh, both compartments. So it's now called uh, mixed. Again, as in this example, I'm going to uh, skip this very quickly. Again, another case of laryngo or pyolaryngocele. 
in these cases, it's very important to comment on the airway uh, and make sure that you label the case uh, correctly, if it is internal or external or mix it. And I think uh, everyone knows that secondary laryngeal seal is a common scenario with um, with primary carcinoma. So if you see a laryngeal seal, in, especially in all patients, make sure that you don't have a underlying uh, tumor. Uh, paranasal sinuses. Um, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, are you, are you still here? Because I'm actually running late. It's 43 minutes now. Yes, we are uh, here. Yeah, I'm not sure. So should I, can I, uh, I mean, can I take like 50 minutes instead of 45 or should I, should I uh, follow the rules? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. So I'll, okay. So I'll try to make it uh, more quickly. So we have, so this is the paranasal sinus and I'm, I'm gonna show you this case of a patient who has, uh, who is presented with a headache, right proptosis uh, and periorbital swelling. And you can see here in the right orbit, uh, this intraorbital uh, soft tissue swelling and in the axial view uh, also uh, it should be, uh, yeah, for some reason it is moving very slowly, but I think, Okay, and the axial uh, plane, uh, you see paranasal um, bilateral maxillary sinusitis, and you can see uh, the uh, ephmoidal sinusitis as well. And when you look at the orbit, there's right proptosis, and there is soft tissue here in the uh, roof of the orbit, and there is frontal sinusitis as well. Uh, then we did MRI uh, to the uh, patient. Uh, so, so the message of this patient, of this case, is always look whenever you see complicated sinusites, even bacterial sinusites in a kid, because bones are very thin, very fine, and there are, there, there, there might be communication without erosion. So although that how, that you don't see a, 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 a clear evidence of bone erosion in this case, there's no erosion. So how did these this infection spread from the sinus to the intraorbital cavity? It's most likely through the veins. So most of these patients have what we call thrombophlebitis involving the ethmoidal veins, anterior or ethmoid, posterior ethmoidal veins or their tributaries. And from there, infection can spread into the orbit. And once infection sp has spread to the orbit, make sure that the patient has no intracranial spread. It's not always easy to see that, but with uh, looking at these images very uh, carefully, you would be able to see that there is intracranial spread here in the MRI. Uh, which uh, tell you that why that why these cases uh, so it, yeah it was working very nicely uh, without streaming so once I share the there you see the the collection here in the in the coronal T two um, the other uh, the other and this is the same patient again. Uh, and we, uh, when we, when you do MRI, you can see with contrast, you can see the enhancing uh, soft tissue in the orbit and the epidural enhancement uh, in the brain. And of course, uh, the diffusion weight images, uh, this is the ADC map will help you uh, identify an abscess by finding a dark focus on ADC map here in Uh I hope that you uh, were able to catch the finding because I'm not able to. So this is actually, these are screenshots of the main pathology. So we're lucky to have this uh, orbital roof pathology uh, after having sinusitis and look at the intracranial cavity to find out, to make sure that you don't have intracranial spread. And this is actually very important, especially in children where it's not uncommon to have complicated uh, sinusitis and sufferiosal abscess as well. Uh, there is an entity that we call POTS puffy tumor. I don't know why do we still call these uh, to, to give these names, but again, whenever you see the scalp abscess in a patient with frontal sinusitis, it's very important to identify because it is a subperiosteal abscess. And again, once you have a subperiosteal abscess, there might be a possibility to have an abscess intracranially as well. And this is the main uh, value of this finding that whenever you see the subperiosteal abscess in the scalp, uh, historically, they didn't have CT at this time. So, but they know that whenever the patient has something in the scalp visible, so probably there might be something intracranially uh, as well, as in this example. So, a POTS puffy tumor, scalp abscess related to frontal sinusitis. And by the way, there's no need to find erosion, sometimes without any bone erosion. And we 
mention this uh, in the case of uh, the kid who has um, epidural superior cell abscess intracranial. So you have it here, uh, again, uh, a, a, a intracranial spread of infection in a patient with pot spotty uh, tumor. Moving to the fungal sinusitis, whenever I say acute invasive fungal sinusitis, so probably I mean two findings. There are two findings that are very suggestive of the invasive fungal sinusitis, which by the way, very critical to make diagnosis as early as possible because mortality will sig get significantly uh, increasing over time. So every hour will affect mortality rates in these patients. Every hour, not every day. So the first thing is enhancement outside the sinus. So here's here are the sinuses. Once you see enhancement outside the sinuses, this means that you have an invasive pathology, which might be, most likely will be fungal uh, origin. And the other thing is, is the lack of enhancement in the mucosa of the sinus or the nasal cavity compared to the normal side here. This is a post-contrast study and see the normal enhancement here and you have here the uh, lack of enhancement and you can see the lack of enhancement in the nasal floor in these patients because these are usually angio-invasive. They cause thrombophlebitis, the, the hyphae actually uh, occupy the vessels and they, call, uh, they, they cause arter arterial thrombosis, arterial infarctions, and they cause this uh, uh, very characteristic pattern. Enhancement outside the, the sinus and absent mucosal enhancement, that is uh, normal mucosal enhancement. And sometimes some people call this the black turbinate sign because in CT, you not you not be able to see it, but when you do MRI and give contrast, you'll be able to see the lack of enhancement in the turbinate, which is very likely to be the middle turbinate. The middle turbinate is the most common target for these uh, uh, fungal uh, infections. Uh, again, so I'm showing you an example of a patient who uh, presents with acute headache. Again, right proptosis, and you can see here the uh, right proptosis, and you can see uh, the pathology here in the maxillary sinuses. What I want you to see is the abnormal, uh, the abnormal uh, attenuation here outside the sinus. So we. We mentioned enhancement. It doesn't have to be enhancement, but it can be just attenuation, soft tissue. So th this is very subtle, but it's very helpful. If you can pick this finding, you cannot imagine how this is going to be helpful to the patient for the, and to the, the clinical scenario as a whole. So you see, that we call this periantral or retroantral soft tissue. Compare it to the other side where we have a clean fat here in the buccal space. We call this the buccal space. Whenever you see the periantral or retroantral attenuation here, this means that you have invasive etiology, invasive uh, uh, process without bone erosion. Remember this, without bone erosion. And this is a case of fungal sinusitis that I know this, this patient and I know this scenario and it was missed. At this stage, the case was missed. It was written as just sinusitis and proptosis. And this uh, finding was missed. But unfortunately, over several days, almost a week, the patient started to develop uh, severe progression, more proptosis, optic nerve stretching, and as you can see here, optic nerve ischemia, diffusion with image of the optic nerve, black or dark ADC, and the patient lost his eye, unfortunately, one week uh, later because of the missed diagnosis. Another case, companion case, acute uh, invasive fun fungal sinusitis, and you can see again the uh, lack of enhancement. So this is very important. So I gave you two examples, one outside the sinus and the other one is inside the sinus, again, with optic nerve uh, stretching and uh, ischemia uh, uh, in, uh, in these patients. Well, so remember that in acute invasive fungal sinusitis, it's very important to uh, see or to identify the non-enhancing sinus mucosa or the black turbinate sign, if you will, because of the angio-invasive uh, nature uh, of these uh, cases. Uh, look at look outside the sinus for any enhancing or attenuation or hyperattenuating fat, which is usually in the peri region, and try to make the diagnosis early as possible because mortality is uh, really high. So it's very bad to miss these cases uh, in the first few hours. Uh, I'll skip this slide and I think I can stop here. I, have, I still have the orbit and the ear and I have a couple of interesting cases uh, in both um, compartments where you can uh, sometimes see in the emergency setting. And I think it's better to, uh, to keep the, this part in, 
uh, in a later session, maybe the maybe the next one, next month, inshallah. Uh, uh, and let me just uh, do one thing. Uh, oh, I think I stopped the sharing. But what I can do is just to put this slide uh, and also share it again. Are you still able to see my uh, my 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 uh, my my screen? No, right? No, it's not it's not shareable. So I, I'm gonna share it here, and I just uh, want you to see again. This is my uh, this is my uh, approach, starting with the three C's: collection, cause, complications. Make sure that you never miss any of the complications, and always start with the end way. This might be a game changer. This might be the the word that will save you in an exam setting, uh, because the examiner will know very well that you are a safe radiologist and safe doctor. And spread uh, is very common with head and neck infections. And make sure you cover all these areas in your uh, imaging approach. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm sorry for taking uh, extra time.